This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. One topic that has always been fascinating to me is the study of cults. Simply stated, a cult is a religion or sect considered as false, unorthodox, or extremist, whose members live outside of a conventional society, and adhere to a strict set of doctrines, guidelines, or rules, and are under the direction of a charismatic leader. Of course, when we think of true crime and cults, or cult-like groups, several high-profile cases come to mind. The People's Temple, led by Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre, the Branch Davidians, led by David Koresh, and the siege of their compound in Waco, and Charles Manson's family and the Tate-LaBianca murders being some of the most well-known. But one type of cult-like group that I find even more interesting and is not as well covered is the narcissistic family cult, or a family that exhibits all the hallmarks of a traditional cult group, but is led by a narcissistic family member, usually a parent. This type of cult family typically hides in plain sight, closing ranks to the outside world. Most observers outside of the family will never suspect the level of control and abuse to which other family members may be subjected. In this week's episode, neighbors, authorities, and even extended family members would be shocked and horrified upon learning of the ritualistic and long-term neglect, abuse, and deprivation 13 children in one family unit would endure. This is the first chapter in the series, The Ties That Bind, The Case of the Turpin Family. Note, just a warning before we begin today's episode. This case includes details about severe child abuse, neglect, and child sexual abuse. Please use discretion before listening if you are particularly sensitive to this subject matter. The 911 call operator answered a call just after dawn on Sunday, January 14, 2018. On the other end of the line was the voice of a little girl who began speaking quickly and in a breathless voice. Over the next 20 minutes, the girl shared a story of abuse and neglect at the hands of her parents. She said at that moment, two of her younger sisters were chained up, crying and in pain. It took some time for the dispatcher to get enough information to find out where to send a patrol car. The girl didn't know her address because she couldn't read. She said she could only recognize numbers and read off a series of digits that would later be revealed as a combination of her home street address and zip code. Asking the girl to provide directions to where she lived was equally unhelpful as she explained that she was rarely let out of the house and so was unfamiliar with the area. The operator was finally able to piece together enough information to send a sheriff's deputy to the girl's approximate location in the town of Paris, California. Officers from the Paris Police Department were also dispatched. When they arrived, they found the caller, who appeared to be about 10 years old, but was actually 17. She was filthy, with black dirt caking her skin. Her hair hung in limp, oily strands, and her clothes were so dirty they could have stood up on their own. Even though the clothing she wore was small, almost child-sized, the girl practically swam inside them. She was so bone-thin. She smelled terrible and looked miserable. When officers asked her questions about where she'd come from, she gave some of the same details she'd shared with the 911 operator. She told them her sisters were chained up and needed help. She also said there were 10 other children in the home. She then pulled out an older model cell phone and showed them a photo of two little girls, also dirty and rail thin, chained to a bunk bed. The girl, who identified herself as Jordan Turpin, was placed in a police vehicle and asked to direct them back to her house. They had to open the windows of the vehicle because the odor coming from the young girl was so strong. Officers arrived at a quiet middle-class neighborhood in the small bedroom community of Paris, California. Paris, with a population of about 7,500 residents at that time, is located in Riverside County, some 70 miles southeast of Los Angeles and approximately 80 miles northeast of San Diego. As they knocked on the door of the four-bedroom home early that Sunday morning, they could hear noises of people scurrying about inside but no one came to the door. Officers continued knocking for several minutes before footsteps were finally heard approaching 
and the door was cracked open. A somewhat disheveled but clean-looking petite woman peeked out at them. Her hair was brown but gray at the roots. She appeared to be in her late 40s or early 50s. A tall man with sandy blonde hair stood behind her. The officers noted his unusual haircut, almost a bob with long bangs past his eyebrows. Some would later describe this hairstyle as Mo from the Three Stooges. Others would say it more closely resembled Jim Carrey's character in Dumb and Dumber. The officers explained they were there to do a welfare check because a child who said she lived there was found wandering in town. From this house? The woman asked, surprised. As the door opened, the officer smelled a terrible odor emanating from inside. It smelled like a mixture of rotting garbage, sewage, and mold. As the officers asked the couple to step aside so they could enter, the male resident crossed his arms across his chest and moved into the doorway, taking a stance as if to block the officers. Where's your warrant, he demanded. The officer, now pushing past the man, stated that a warrant was not required for a welfare check on minors. The officers entered the front room and were hit in the face with a putrid stench that made them gasp. One officer's body camera recorded their tour of the home and what they found inside. Garbage was strewn around the house and piled up everywhere. Piles of what appeared to be human and animal waste were on the floors and smeared on the walls. Boxes and other debris were stacked up, covering every surface in most of the rooms. Several moldy pumpkin pies were found sitting on a kitchen counter. But that wasn't the worst of it. Far more disturbing was the state of the couple's children who were found locked inside their bedrooms. All of the children were filthy, their skin so caked with dirt it was almost black. Oddly, their hands were clean, and the officers could see that their skin was deathly pale. They were all extremely thin to the point of appearing starved. Their clothes were very dirty and foul-smelling. Officers were shocked to learn their ages. They all looked very young, but with the exception of the youngest child who was only two, all were over 12 years old. The six oldest were all over the age of 20. The eldest child named Jennifer was just a month away from her 30th birthday. Some of the children were found chained to their beds. One bedroom was obscured by a stack of boxes, but the deputy ordered them moved. Upon entering, they found 23-year-old Jonathan Turpin tightly chained, a locked padlock keeping him almost immobile. Chains and padlocks dangled from most of the bed frames in all of the rooms. Bruises were found on the children's arms and wrists at the places where the chains had been secured. The couple was identified as the children's parents, David Turpin, age 57, and his wife Louise, age 49. All 13 of their children, ages 29 to 2 years old, were present and resided in the home. Child Protective Service agents were called to look after the children and get them to a safe place. David and Louise Turpin were placed under arrest for child abuse and child endangerment. David Turpin sobbed as he was handcuffed and placed into a police vehicle. Louise Turpin, the children's mother, smirked and spat on the ground as she was led away. Seventeen-year-old Jordan Turpin escaped from the home where she had been held a virtual prisoner by her parents. Her 911 call facilitated her rescue and that of her 12 siblings. They were found living in deplorable conditions and half-starved. The siblings were transported to the Paris Police Department and provided with food which they ate eagerly. Medics were called in to assess their condition and treated them on the spot with IV drips containing antibiotics, vitamins, and nutrients. They would later be sent to two different area hospitals for thorough health assessments and treatment. While social workers stayed with the younger children, some of the older Turpin siblings were interviewed by detectives. The first to be questioned was Jordan, who bravely alerted authorities. Like all of the Turpin children, Jordan appeared to be much younger than her actual age. Detectives guessed the 17-year-old to be no older than 10. She also had the limited vocabulary of someone of about the age of seven or eight. Jordan always referred to her parents as mother and father, as did all the children. None of them, not even the youngest ones, called them mom and dad or mommy and daddy. Jordan explained that her parents preferred to be addressed more formally, quote, like in the Bible days, end quote. She described some of the rules and routines imposed by her parents. 
the children spent 20 hours a day locked in their bedrooms. Some who had been caught getting out of their beds without permission or breaking other rules were chained up. The children were forced to sleep during the day and only allowed to get out of bed at 11 p.m. They could then use the bathroom and were given one very small meal per day. The menu was always the same, either peanut butter or bologna sandwiches or frozen burritos and chips. They were not allowed to exercise and almost never went outside. They were ordered back to bed at 3 a.m. Jordan said that she herself had never been chained, but some of her siblings were almost constantly chained to their beds. They were being punished for previously getting out of their beds to pace inside the rooms or for sneaking into the kitchen to get food. When these breaches were discovered, their parents restrained them with padlocks and chains. Some had been chained up this way for weeks and even months. Jonathan, who officers found restrained in his bed, had been chained for the majority of the day during the past six years, except to eat, brush his teeth, and use the bathroom once a day. Other Turpin children, 25-year-old Joshua, 23-year-old Jonathan, 11-year-old Jalissa, and 18-year-old Janetta, gave even more horrific details of their lives. The children wore the same clothes every day, which were never washed. They were not allowed to wash themselves above the wrists, or mother would punish them for wasting water. The last bath any of them had been allowed to take was over seven months earlier. The occasion? Mother's Day. Only the oldest child, 29-year-old Jennifer, had ever received any formal schooling and only up until the third grade. David Turpin was registered as a homeschool educator and was supposed to be providing a full school curriculum at home for his children. The reality was that all of his children were illiterate and none could even recognize the entire alphabet. However, the children reported that they had been required by their father to memorize large portions of the Bible. What little teaching they had received had been done by Jennifer Turpin, who shared as much of her third grade education as she could remember. The children also received beatings from both of their parents. Mother was especially violent, slapping, choking, and pitching them. Pitching was what the kids called it when their mother grabbed them by the hair and threw them. They would also be hit with objects. At first, father used a leather belt, but he graduated to using the metal belt buckle. But the worst of the worst, according to Jonathan, was when they'd be beaten with a wooden oar. Investigators and social workers noted that all the Turpin siblings had little knowledge of most things, including the names of the months, the difference between a state and a country, or even how to spell their own names. Most had only been to see a doctor once in their lives, and none had ever seen a dentist. They didn't understand what certain words meant, including medication and bruise. Testing and examination by doctors determined that the long-term abuse and neglect the Turpin children had suffered resulted in a myriad of health problems, some permanent. All of them, except for two-year-old Jana, were suffering from severe malnourishment, nerve damage, and mental and cognitive impairment. Most of the adult children had loss of their muscle functions due to poor nutrition and lack of exercise. All were underweight, some as much as 50 pounds. 29-year-old Jennifer weighed only 80 pounds. She was diagnosed with acute B12 deficiency, which had caused peripheral neuropathy, resulting in numbness and weakness in her hands and feet. Joshua, 5'8", weighed just 115 pounds. He was diagnosed with severe iron and vitamin D deficiency. Most of his siblings were also severely vitamin deficient. Jonathan, who'd been restrained with ropes and chains the most, also suffered from skeletal abnormalities. He was 5'7", but weighed only 100 pounds. Several of the younger children were so underweight they had suffered organ damage to their hearts, kidneys, and or livers. Most also suffered from stunted growth, and at least two of the older girls, doctors reported, would probably never be able to bear children due to their health issues. Once the extent of the neglect, abuse, and torture the children had been subjected to was reported to authorities, David and Louise Turpin were charged with 12 counts each of torture and false imprisonment, seven counts of abuse of a dependent adult, and six counts of child abuse. Louise Turpin was held on $9 million bail and David Turpin on $12 million. At their preliminary hearing, they both pled not guilty.
Children found starved in House of Horrors, the headlines read, once the news of the Turpin's arrest reached the media. People began to flock to the once quiet, nondescript neighborhood in Paris, California, unable to imagine how such a thing had happened right under their noses. Hadn't anyone noticed anything, they wondered? Weren't any suspicions raised? There wasn't one child, or even two or three, being held captive, starved, and abused in the Turpin home, but 13. It was just so hard to believe, and people sought answers to make sense of it all. The first questions raised were just who were David and Louise Turpin, and what could bring them to treat their own children this way? The first fact uncovered about David and Louise Turpin that caused tongues to wag was that at age 17, David Turpin met 10-year-old Louise Ann Robinette and was immediately smitten with her. By the time she was 12, Louise told her family that she was going to marry David Turpin and have a dozen children. A few years later, the two ran away together when she was 16 and he was 23. David Turpin was born on October 17, 1961, in Princeton, West Virginia, to James and Betty Turpin. His brother, James Randolph, called Randy, was three years his senior. The Turpins were members of the Princeton Church of God, a Pentecostal Christian church. David Turpin's grandfather, King Turpin Jr., was a Pentecostal preacher, and David admired and respected him greatly. David was always a serious young man. He stood out from his classmates, who, in the 1970s, dressed in bell-bottom jeans and tie-dyed t-shirts, while David himself preferred to wear slacks and bow ties. By the time he was a teen, he'd already decided that his Mo Howard bowl cut was the hairstyle he'd commit to for the rest of his life. Some of his Princeton High School classmates would take to playfully calling him Mr. Spock, due to said haircut and his straight-faced demeanor. David didn't socialize much in high school, nor did anyone recall him ever dating. David Turpin was always one of the smartest kids in his class. His favorite subjects were math and science. He graduated with honors in 1979 and earned a scholarship to Virginia Tech to study electrical engineering. The Turpins were longtime friends with the Robinette family. Both were members of the Princeton Church of God, and their lives revolved around church attendance and church activities. Louise was the daughter of Ellen, Wayne, and Phyllis Robinette. Phyllis had also been a teen bride, marrying Wayne when she was just 17 and he 19. Nine months after they wed, Louise was born on May 24, 1968. Louise had two much younger sisters, Elizabeth, who was eight years younger, and Teresa, who was 12 years her junior. Louise's maternal grandfather, John Thomas Taylor, was a World War II vet who made a fortune in real estate after returning from the war. He was one of the wealthiest men in town and also owned and operated the only gas station in Princeton. But John Taylor was known to be a creep around young girls, very young girls. He would often set his sights on teen and preteen girls who visited his shell station or whom he saw around town. These girls would report that Taylor got handsy with them, touching them inappropriately and generally giving young girls the heebie-jeebies. Taylor wasn't just a creep though. He was also a child predator. He had sexually abused his own daughter Phyllis, Louise's mother, when she was just a girl. Some would say this was the reason that Phyllis left home and married so young, to escape her father's abuse. But Phyllis and Wayne Robinette were not a happy couple. Phyllis was just a girl when she became a wife and mother and now felt prematurely tied down. She began going out with friends to drink and socialize and she and her husband fought about this. When her mother was away, Louise was often left in charge of caring for her younger sister, Elizabeth. When Louise was still a little girl, her grandfather began molesting her as well. To make things even worse was the fact that Louise's mother not only didn't protect her from the man she knew was a pedophile, but actually allowed him to sexually abuse her daughter. Phyllis would offer her daughter up to her father in exchange for money when she needed it. She turned a blind eye, but knew what was going on since she herself had been subjected to her father's abuse. Louise became withdrawn and depressed. Louise didn't socialize much with her classmates and, as an outsider, got picked on by the other kids. She never stood up to them, but instead withdrew into herself even more. Princeton High School students who were classmates of Louise's would later only describe her as quiet. The sexual abuse by her grandfather continued for years, until one day in 1982, when Louise was 14. Her grandmother, Mary, caught her husband raping Louise. 
She chased him out of the house with a frying pan and filed for divorce the next day. The incident, however, was never reported to authorities. Rather than this ending the sexual abuse, Louise's sister Elizabeth would later report that it became worse. Phyllis continued to take all three of her daughters to visit their grandfather, who was now living alone and had free reign with her children. Louise stepped in as her sister's protector and would take their place to divert him away from the younger girls. All three girls would be abused by John Taylor during their lifetime. Phyllis and Wayne Robinette's marriage was on the rocks, and they fought frequently. Phyllis would drop her daughters with her father to spend time with friends or in bars. By the time she was in her teens, Louise was desperate to get away from home and the abuse. She jumped at the opportunity then when David Turpin, who was already attending college, showed interest in her. They began meeting in secret whenever he was home on a school break. The relationship was kept secret, but they made plans to run away together. However, when Phyllis discovered her 15-year-old daughter was dating the 22-year-old college student, she gave them her blessing and hid it from her husband. She would later justify this decision, saying that they knew the Turpin family for years and that David was a, quote, good boy. David Turpin graduated from Virginia Tech with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in the spring of 1984. Around Christmas time, Louise told her sister Elizabeth that she was planning to marry David Turpin. She also said that she and David were going to be wealthy and live in a big house. In January of 1985, David donned a fake mustache to make himself look older and arrived at the Princeton High School attendance office. Identifying himself as Louise's father, he checked her out of school for the day. Turpin had recently been hired by General Dynamics, a U.S. defense contractor based in Fort Worth, Texas. He now drove Louise back to Texas with him. Being only 16, she was too young to legally marry David Turpin, but wanted to be with him anyway on the promise that they'd wed as soon as they were able. When her parents discovered that Louise had run off with the Turpin boy, they had a big fight. Wayne Robinette blamed his wife for allowing their teenage daughter to see Turpin in secret. They reported it to the police. When the couple was rounded up by the Fort Worth police, David's parents begged the Robinettes not to press charges. He could face prison time for taking a minor over state lines, and they said his future would be ruined. Once Louise was returned to West Virginia, Wayne Robinette thought it was better to give his 16-year-old permission to marry rather than face scandal in his tight-knit church community about his child running off with a 23-year-old man. David and Louise Turpin married on February 11, 1985, in Parisburg, Virginia. They immediately returned to Fort Worth to begin their life together. Hi, everyone. This is Margot from Military Murder Podcast. I'll be featured at CrimeCon 22 in Las Vegas, and I hope to see you there. Come and hang out with me and Esther on Podcast Row. We can take pictures, chat true crime, and just indulge in everything that Vegas has to offer. But before you get there, be sure to check out my show, Military Murder. I just released a two-part episode on the military's very own Jody Arias, a woman named Yvette Davila who murdered two fellow soldiers and kidnapped their baby. It's episode 105 and 106, and that case will leave you in shock. As a military veteran and a prior military attorney, I cover cases about military true crime, cases such as Vanessa Guillen and the injustice done to Lavina Johnson. But trust me, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. There are over 100 episodes in the Military Murder Catalog, so you will have plenty of content to binge when you're all caught up with Once Upon a Crime. See you in Vegas. David and Louise lived in Fort Worth for two years while he began his career with General Dynamics. In 1987, his job was transferred to Southern California. The Turpins moved to the town of Brea, located in Orange County, and close to the Disneyland Amusement Park. They became big fans of Disney and would return multiple times over the years. Louise wrote home to tell her sisters and her mother about the wonderful life she and David had in California. She bragged about all the things her husband bought her, the trips they went on, and the expensive restaurants where they dined. Things were not going so well for Louise's family back in West Virginia. Soon after Louise left for Texas, her parents divorced. Wayne had discovered that his wife was having an affair. 
she became pregnant with her boyfriend Billy Lambert's child. Before she gave birth, the baby's father died of a brain hemorrhage while behind the wheel of his car. He crashed and died instantly. Phyllis gave birth to a son a couple of months later and named the boy Billy after his father. Phyllis next had an affair with her children's school's custodian and had two children with him before they split four years later. Phyllis Robinette and her children would bounce around from one low-rent residence to another. At times, they were homeless. Phyllis would resort to sex work at times to feed her children and keep a roof over their heads. She still ran to her father for money, and her children continued to be abused by him. In 1988, David and Louise's first child was born, a girl they named Jennifer. Soon after the baby's birth, Louise invited her mother and sisters to visit her in California. While they were there, David and Louise took them on trips to Disneyland, Universal Studios, and to tour Hollywood. They paid for all their travel expenses and meals. Phyllis and her children had very little money, and at that time, they were living in a homeless shelter in Tennessee. The vacation to California was a real treat and one her sisters would never forget. Her sisters later reported that Louise doted on her baby daughter and her home was neat and tidy. Louise's family was also impressed with her lifestyle and thought that David must be bringing home a very good salary to afford all the extras. In 1990, David Turpin was transferred back to Fort Worth. General Dynamics was in the process of being bought out by Lockheed Martin Aerospace he was given a raise in salary that would soon exceed six figures. Upon returning to Texas, the Turpins purchased a four-bedroom, two-bathroom house located at 3225 Roddy Drive in a middle-class neighborhood in Fort Worth. But while Louise bragged about her money and lifestyle to her family, the Turpins were living well beyond their means. They became overwhelmed with credit card debt and feared losing their home. So in 1992, they filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Several of their debts were forgiven, and they were able to keep their cars and home. That same year, their second child, a son they named Joshua David, was born. Louise never disclosed her financial problems to her family. Jennifer began grade school at the local public school, Meadowbrook Elementary. Her classmates would later remember the little girl by the cruel nickname, Cootie Kit. She was given this nickname because each day she arrived at school wearing the same dirty, unwashed outfit with oily and uncombed hair. She was teased and excluded, but Jennifer was always optimistic and full of energy. She was the first one to enthusiastically join in school activities and games. She loved participating, even though she had no real friends. It must have been truly heartbreaking to watch. However, it appears that there was no attempt made by teachers or other school staff to look into what was going on for Jennifer at home. In 1993 and 1995, the Turpins' third and fourth children, Jessica and Jonathan, were born. By this time, I'm sure you've noticed that all the children's names begin with the letter J. In 1996, the Turpins took their four children to West Virginia to visit their families. Family members noted that the children were dressed identically at all times and that their parents strictly controlled them with almost military precision. They all stood together in a straight line when called to do so, lining up from oldest to youngest. They also walked in a straight line, one behind the other, when they were out with their parents. Relatives described David and Louise's parenting style as strict, but Louise's family justified it by saying that multiple young children in a family needed discipline to keep them in check. Louise's 19-year-old sister, Elizabeth, now attending college in Tennessee, asked if she could return with her sister and her family to spend the summer in Fort Worth. Her sister agreed, but on the drive back to Texas, she confided to Elizabeth that they were going to stop at a casino so Louise could gamble. Elizabeth was shocked by this news, since they'd both grown up in a Pentecostal church, where gambling, drinking, and other worldly activities were forbidden. David, especially, claimed to still be a strict adherent of his Pentecostal upbringing. He bragged about raising his family in a good Christian household. Why then, her sister wondered, did they think it was okay to gamble in a casino when that went against their beliefs? Louise spent a couple of hours in the casino while Elizabeth and the other children waited outside. When Louise and David returned, Elizabeth heard them arguing about how much money Louise had lost at the gambling tables. David would later tell his sister-in-law that Louise had a gambling addiction. Once in Texas, Elizabeth saw even more disturbing evidence of how strictly Louise and David controlled their children. They had to ask permission for everything, even to use the bathroom and to eat. The eating ritual she found especially bizarre. 
This was later described in author John Glatt's book, The Family Next Door. Quote, After placing the plates of food on the table, she would call the children down to eat one at a time. And for some reason, Louise was always harder on Jennifer than any of the others. Before being allowed to eat, the first grader had to look her mother in the eye and smile, and then wait for it to be returned. And then Louise would say, Okay, sit down, Elizabeth said. And then she would literally just sit there, waiting for permission to eat. And then Louise would tell her, Okay, you can eat. After Jennifer had finished eating, her mother would tell her to stand up, look at her, and smile, before sending her back to her bedroom. It was like a secret code, recalled Elizabeth, at every meal, end quote. Elizabeth also noted that the children were confined to their rooms for long periods of time and that neither of their parents displayed any affection towards them, not even holding baby Jonathan for any length of time. Louise would just put him in his crib and let him cry himself to sleep. Elizabeth took a summer job in Fort Worth, and it was at that time that Louise began controlling her sister's life as well. She forbid her from having any friends over, didn't allow her to go out with anyone outside of the family, and she wasn't even allowed to receive phone calls. When Louise discovered that her sister was regularly having lunch with the male co-worker, she flew into a rage and kicked her out of the house. Elizabeth called repeatedly to be let back into the house, if only to retrieve some clothes, but Louise ignored her. For three days, Elizabeth was locked out of the house and had nowhere to go. To retrieve her belongings, she finally threatened to call the police. Louise finally let her in, but wouldn't speak to her. Elizabeth packed up her things and returned to Tennessee. In 1997, when Jennifer began third grade, the Turpin's fifth child, Joy, was born. Jennifer started out the school year wearing even dirtier clothing and smelling as if she hadn't bathed in days, if not weeks. But when Louise's sister visited that year, she noticed several brand new dresses in Jennifer's closet, most with the tags still attached. They were expensive, and it appeared that Jennifer had outgrown them long before and never been allowed to wear them. In 1998, when Louise was pregnant with their sixth child, Julianne, the Turpins filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy for the second time. Louise had lost a lot of money gambling, and they were still racking up new debt on credit cards. Louise would brag to her sister that they had purchased new toys and clothes for all the children, maxing out their credit cards before filing for Chapter 7. She told Elizabeth that she knew how to work the system and would never have to pay for these purchases. Elizabeth told her that that was stealing. Louise became angry and hung up on her. The following year, the Turpin house on Roddy Drive was foreclosed on due to lack of payment on the mortgage. Around the same time, Jennifer stopped attending Meadowbrook Elementary before completing the third grade. She would never attend another public school, and her siblings would never spend one day enrolled in school. David Turpin had decided to homeschool all his children. One day, the Turpin family disappeared from Fort Worth. Neighbors saw toys, garbage, and junk left behind by the family piled up in their yard. When the bank took possession of the home, they were appalled at its condition. The odor was putrid. The carpets caked with dirt and dried feces appeared to be smeared on some of the walls. Bags of rotting garbage, broken furniture, and other possessions had been left inside to mold and decay in the Texas heat. The Turpins packed up their now seven children, Janetta being born in 1999, and rented a house in Rio Vista, Texas. The home at 595 Hill Country Road was located in a newer division of cookie-cutter tract homes. Rio Vista was a small town of less than 800 people. In this small-town environment, neighbors knew one another and were friendly. The Turpins were an anomaly, keeping to themselves with their door tightly shut and blinds drawn at all times to discourage prying eyes. It was while in Rio Vista, the children later said, that the abuse escalated. Completely isolated from outsiders, David began conditioning his children to fear strangers. They were taught never to speak to anyone outside of the family about anything, especially what took place in their home. The neighbor, whose children sometimes saw the chirping kids in their front yard and asked them to play, noted that the kids were strangely tight-lipped, never talking about their parents or about themselves, and becoming nervous when asked any questions. The kids were rarely seen outside as the months passed. To keep outsiders from monitoring their activities in any way, David and Louise started imposing a curfew, requiring their children to sleep during the day and wake up at 11 p.m. to eat and use the bathroom. Their day was only four hours long, however, because they were required to go back to bed at 3 a.m. 
Oddly, because they were given almost no instruction in reading or writing, and most of the Turpin children were illiterate, their parents still provided them journals, encouraging them to write in them daily. Jennifer, the oldest Turpin child and the only one with any formal education, tried her best to teach her siblings the alphabet and how to read a little, but she didn't get far as a reading teacher with her third grade education. Her siblings did the best they could, sometimes spelling phonetically, sometimes drawing pictures to convey their thoughts and feelings, and to record what was happening in their home. These journals would later be used by prosecutors to outline the abuse case against their parents. The Turpin home in Rio Vista, like the ones before it, became an eyesore, with junk and garbage dumped in the front yard. The weeds grew tall, and the lawn, unmaintained, went to seed. The inside of the house fared far worse, with moldy food, rotting garbage, and human waste soiling and smelling up the place. The smell clung to its inhabitants' hair, clothing, and even their skin. The odor could not be escaped, even if the children had been allowed to open a door or window, which was forbidden. By May of 2004, the Turpins had been living in the house on Hill Country Road for almost five years, when a brand new double-wide mobile home was brought onto the property. The Turpins had purchased it at a cost of over $60,000. They all moved into it, because the main house had become so filthy it was uninhabitable. Jonathan would later report that soon after moving into the mobile home, his father constructed cages to lock the children into if they broke any of the rules, like getting out of bed to use the bathroom, quote, stealing food, etc. The cages were built seven foot high and five foot tall, and were divided into two sides to hold two prisoners at a time if needed. These cages were built out of pegboard siding and with a five-inch gap left on the bottom to push food through to their caged children. Only one child at a time was allowed out of their rooms to eat or use the bathroom, and usually only once per day. The children no longer went outside and rarely saw the sun. Their skin became pale, they grew thinner, and began to resemble ghost children. But over time, their flesh became so caked with dirt, they appeared darker. The children were now only allowed to bathe on an average about once a year. Even while neglecting, starving, and beating the children they had, Louise Turpin continued making babies. By 2006, there were a dozen Turpin children. The number of kids 12-year-old Louise had told her sister she would have with David Turpin someday. Jordan was born in 2000, James in 2002, Joanna in 2003, Jolinda in 2004, and Jalissa in 2006. Not long after moving their children into the mobile home, David and Louise Turpin moved out, taking with them only the baby, Jalissa. They rented an apartment almost an hour away. The rest of the children were left alone in the cramped trailer. Their father only stopped by to drop off meager rations of mostly frozen food, while their mother rarely visited at all. This continued for four years. At this time, the children ranged in age from 19 to 9 years old. Even with their parents absent, they were so terrified of the punishments they'd receive for any infractions that the children continued to be controlled long distance by David and Louise. They would be interrogated to find out if their siblings had broken any of the rules. Too scared to lie, the older kids would rat out the younger children. They would then be instructed to punish the rule breakers by locking them in the cages. Jennifer and Joshua, the two eldest and now legally adults, both tried at least once to escape. Joshua began walking into town but became overwhelmed and quickly returned on his own. He would later say he stayed to help his siblings survive. Jennifer escaped one evening and was found running down the road by a neighbor who picked her up in their car. She refused to give the stranger her name, but asked how she could get a job, an apartment, and a car. She made it into town and began asking around about a job, but with no identification, she had little chance of being hired anywhere. I would imagine that wearing soiled clothes and with dirty hair and an unwashed body, people may have assumed she was homeless and or mentally ill. Still, it's strange that no one tried to help or at least call authorities to do a welfare check. Another missed opportunity. Jennifer soon gave up, and not knowing what else to do, she called her mother, who picked her up and returned her to the trailer. While David and Louise Turpin were subjecting their children to a life of abuse, deprivation, and starvation, 
they themselves were living it up. Louise confessed to her sister that she and David were no longer following a Christian lifestyle, but instead drinking in bars, gambling in casinos, and Louise even confessed to having sex with other men. She called the relationship an open marriage, but it's unclear whether David was also having sex outside of the marriage. It appears that he encouraged his wife to do so, and he would either watch or videotape these encounters. The children were given very little food, and the food they did receive was far from nutritious, mostly junk food like chips and frozen meals. In contrast, David and Louise ate out in restaurants frequently. None of the restaurant employees where they were regulars recalled ever seeing the children with them or the Turpins ordering extra food to take home. David purchased a new Ford Mustang for himself every year, and they had amassed over $30,000 in car loans. They owned a large 12-seat van, although the children were rarely taken anywhere. In 2010, David Turpin lost his job at Lockheed and went on unemployment. Creditors began arriving to repossess their vehicles for non-payment. On April 5th, the bank foreclosed on their Rio Vista home for defaulting on their mortgage payment. Once again, the Turpins packed up and disappeared. This time, however, the house was left in even worse condition. Again, garbage and feces littered the house, and now dirty diapers were also piled waist-high on the carpets. In addition, the carcasses of a dog and a cat were found among the garbage. Most disturbingly, padlocks were found everywhere, on kitchen cabinets, doors, and some were left hanging from the rails of the children's bunk beds. Ropes were also found tied to the beds. It took the mortgage company three months to clean the house enough to place it on the market. The new owner still had to spend $30,000 to make the home livable. In June 2010, the Turpins moved into their new home, a rented 2,400-square-foot, five-bedroom house in Riverside County. The home was located in the town of Marietta, 65 miles north of San Diego. David was still unemployed, and Louise made excuses to our family who asked to visit. They no longer had enough available on credit cards to pay for their relatives' travel and entertainment and didn't want to admit that they couldn't afford to host them. Instead, Louise soon cut off all contact with her family. With their mother back in the home full-time now, the children were subjected to even more abuse. They were tied to their beds for days at a time, given beatings for sneaking food, they were hungry all the time, and breaking other rules. But the Turpins did allow their older children to have smartphones. They gave Jennifer one of their older cell phones. By this time, they believed that their control over their children was so complete, they no longer had to worry about escape attempts. Even while Louise was physically abusing her children, she began staging carefully constructed photo ops with her entire family. All 13 children were allowed to bathe and were then dressed in matching outfits. The boys were dressed like their father and also sported mop-top haircuts like his. The girls' dresses were identical to their mother's. The whole family stood in a row, with the children directed to smile as photos were snapped. Louise sent copies of these photos to her family, but they were also planned for another purpose. Louise had become a fan of reality television series like John and Kate Plus 8 and 17 Kids and Counting, shows that turn ordinary Americans with large families into celebrities. Louise was sure the Turpins would be the next reality TV family to hit the big time and began crafting emails to television production companies with photos of her large family attached. In January 2011, David finally secured a new job in San Diego, working for Northrop Grumman. His starting salary was $143,000, and he and Louise celebrated by planning another family trip to Disneyland that summer. This time, David's brother Randy and his family came out to California and were squired around town, along with David's family of 15. A week after his family left town, David Turpin filed for bankruptcy for the third time. They now owed almost a quarter of a million dollars to creditors, including almost $90,000 on credit cards. A few months later, most of their debt was forgiven by the bankruptcy court, with the Turpins only required to pay $424 a month for four years to the Ford Motor Company. Immediately after their debt was discharged, David and Louise planned a trip to Las Vegas to renew their wedding vows. Their ceremony was performed by an Elvis impersonator. It would be the first of three vow renewal ceremonies they would have in as many years, all performed by the same Elvis impersonator. Their children would be brought along on the second and third trips to Las Vegas. 
The Turpins purchased the deluxe package, which included photos and videos of them and the children participating in the ceremony and dancing with the Elvis impersonator during the short wedding reception afterward. They also invited David's parents out to visit, and once again, the family all visited Disneyland. The children were photographed wearing matching outfits and all looking much younger than their actual ages. They were so thin, their collarbones and their elbows jutted out sharply. In the spring of 2012, all of the children fell ill, most likely from malnourishment and the filthy conditions they were forced to live in. None had ever seen a doctor, not even when they received serious neck and back injuries after being thrown or pushed down the stairs by Louise. But this time, their parents relented and took them to the hospital for treatment. Oddly, no red flags were raised by medical personnel who treated them, and the turbans returned home without being questioned. David and Louise Turpin bought a brand new four-bedroom house after qualifying for a $350,000 Federal Housing Administration loan. The house was located at 160 Muir Woods Road in Paris, California. With David Turpin's long commute of almost 80 miles each way from home to work, Louise spent long hours alone with the children. She was angry all the time, and the beatings the children received escalated. She began chaining most of them up for multiple days at a time. Louise favored the older children, Jennifer, Joshua, Julianne, and Janetta. She rewarded them for spying on their siblings and reporting any infractions to her. They were also the only ones allowed to leave the house occasionally to accompany her on errands. Louise added elements of psychological torture to her repertoire now. Her children's diet never varied. For years, they were given peanut butter or bologna sandwiches, and occasionally frozen meals. But Louise would buy other food the children weren't allowed to eat, like pie or pizza. She would then leave these food items out in plain view, but forbid them to eat it. Instead, they had to watch it grow moldy and eventually be thrown into the trash. It was the same type of cruelty she had subjected Jennifer to when she was forced to wear the same dirty clothes every day to school while brand new dresses hung in her closet. Louise had been trying to have a 13th child for several years with no luck. In 2015, she got her wish when she became pregnant with her 13th and final child, Jana. There were 10 years between baby Jana and the next youngest Turpin, Julissa, born in 2006. At the time of Jana's birth, Louise Turpin was 47 years old. In early 2016, Jordan Turpin, now 16, attempted to run away from home after her mother nearly choked her to death upon discovering she'd watched a Justin Bieber video on her hand-me-down cell phone. The cell phone, which had been given to Jordan by her brother Jonathan, was deactivated from the Turpin cell phone account, but she was still able to access the internet on it using their home Wi-Fi connection. Jordan could no longer stand by and watch her younger sisters, Jolinda and Jalissa, cry in their beds, tightly chained and in pain. She knew she needed to let someone know what was going on in her home, so she first snapped a couple of pictures of 13-year-old Jalinda and 12-year-old Jalissa chained to their beds. Jordan had opened social media accounts, including Twitter and Instagram, which she used to chat with other teens online. After becoming online friends with one boy, Jordan began confiding in him about her parents' abuse. He encouraged her to go to the authorities, and she began to plan her escape. She also learned that her deactivated cell phone could still dial 911. In January 2018, Jordan overheard her parents talking about moving to Oklahoma City. Her father's job with Northrop Grumman was being relocated to that city, almost 1,300 miles east. She knew she had to act quickly before this happened. She didn't know if the abuse would escalate even further, endangering the lives of her and her siblings, or if the location of their new home would allow any kind of escape. So Jordan and her 13-year-old sister Jalinda squeezed himself out of their bedroom window in the early morning hours of January 14th to summon help. Jalinda soon became too scared to leave and returned inside, but Jordan continued on her own, dialing 911 when she felt she was a safe enough distance away from her house of horrors. After the rescue of the 13 Turpin children, David and Louise were charged with torture, child abuse, and child endangerment. Jordan also reported to authorities that her father had touched her inappropriately beginning at the age of 12 
and had kissed her in a sexual manner several times since then. Charges for child molestation were added for him. The prosecutor stated to the media that the Turpin case was, quote, among the worst, most aggravated child abuse cases I've ever seen, end quote. At their initial hearing, the Turpins pled not guilty to all charges. At a pretrial hearing, the defense ticked off the evidence against the couple. The photos taken by Jordan of her siblings chained to their beds, videos taken secretly in the home of their injuries and abuse, the journals kept by the children recording their experiences in the home, videos and photos of the horrific conditions in which the children were kept, and doctors' reports of the physical, mental, and cognitive damage they suffered. Once they realized how much evidence the prosecution had gathered to present to a jury, the Turpins changed their mind and agreed to take a plea deal. On February 22, 2019, they pled guilty to 14 felony counts of torture, child endangerment, and false imprisonment. They had originally faced over 50 charges each. The judge agreed to accept the plea, and their sentencing hearing was held on April 19. David and Louise Turpin were both sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after serving 25 years. At the sentencing, some of their children read victims' impact statements. Quote, My parents took my whole life from me, Jennifer, age 30, the firstborn Turpin child, read in a pre-written statement. But now I'm taking my whole life back. I saw my dad change my mom. They almost changed me. I fought to become the person I am. I am a fighter. Joshua Turpin said, I cannot describe in words what we went through growing up. Sometimes I still have nightmares of things that had happened, such as my siblings being chained or getting beaten. But that is the past and this is now. I love my parents and forgive them for a lot of the things they did to us. End quote. Joy Turpin, 22, said, I want the court to know that our parents loved each other and loved each of their children. People in Texas, even friends, said our parents were having too many children. Our parents didn't agree. They felt that God blessed them with all their children, so they kept away from the world and trusted God would guide them through life. Joy also said she believed that her parents, quote, tried their best to raise all 13 of us, and they wanted to give us a good life. They believed everything they did was to protect us, end quote. Joy asked the court to send her parents to prisons close by, in case any of the children wanted to visit them. She also asked for the protective order to be lifted so they could see their parents. Both parents cried during the sentencing hearing. Louise said, quote, I'm sorry for everything I've done to hurt my children. I love my children so much. I want them to know mom and dad are going to be okay, end quote. David Turpin said, I never intended for any harm to come to my children. I hope the very best for my children in the future, end quote. He was too overcome with emotion to finish his statement, so he had his attorney finish reading it for him. David Turpin was originally sent to Mule Creek State Prison but was later transferred to the California State Prison in Corcoran, California, where Charles Manson was once incarcerated. Louise Turpin is serving her sentence at the Central California Women's Facility. Rick Ross, an expert on cults and the founder of the Cult Education Institute, was interviewed by author John Glatt for his book, The Family Next Door. He describes the power dynamic between David and Louise Turpin and how David Turpin was able to create a narcissistic family cult along with his wife. He believes that David Turpin molded his family through the use of a set of rules and doctrines that were a warped version of his Pentecostal beliefs. Within this structure, he served as a cult-like charismatic leader. This he based on the memories of his much-admired preacher grandfather, trying to mimic the respect and authority he wielded from a legitimate pulpit. According to another article on the subject, growing up in a narcissistic family unit requires one pathological narcissistic parent to be married to or in a relationship with a codependent partner. The narcissistic parent fulfills the role of cult leader, while the codependent partner, who has little self-esteem of their own, is easily manipulated, becoming a devoted follower or second-in-command. In my opinion, David Turpin then created a strict sense of guidelines for his family to follow and gave Louise the power to enforce the rules and punish the rule breakers. For the first time in her life, Louise, who'd been sexually abused by her grandfather and exploited by her mother, immediately relished the role as one with power over others as David's second-in-command. 
Family cults are all about power, control, and domination, and the Turpins exhibited their power by turning their children into their unquestioning devotees. Devotees of a cult leader don't grow up and move out, so in this closed system created by their parents, the Turpin children would never have been granted their freedom or allowed autonomy. Their sole reason for existing in their parents' minds was to serve David and Louise's need for power and control. To keep this power, as the children grew up, their parents crushed their will, weakened their bodies and their minds, and destroyed any hope they had for a life outside of the family cult. The children would say that their mother was the one in charge, as she was the parent who enforced the rules and carried out the punishments. But Louise's sister would describe the real power dynamic at play between her sister and David. Whenever Louise did anything, she said, she always saw her look to David for his approval. David would give an almost imperceptible nod of his head in agreement with Louise, or would frown and cross his arms to express disapproval. In this way, Louise was also controlled by David, needing constant affirmation that what she was doing was correct. But Louise became addicted to the feeling of power over her dependent children, and took the abuse to extreme levels to please her husband and for her own satisfaction. When they isolated their children by closing them off first from their community and then even their own family, not allowing them to attend school or have conversations with anyone outside of the home, the Turpins created a closed family unit, which didn't allow for the children to learn any other ways of being or any other points of view. In this way, they became dependent on their parents to create their reality. The level of neglect, abuse, and torture they subjected their children to indicates that David and Louise Turpin had crossed over into unreality. In the world they created, their children were merely objects to be used, abused, or ignored at their whim. All the children spent several weeks in the hospital for treatment. After they were released, six of the younger Turpin children were placed into two separate foster homes. It was later reported that in one foster care home, several of the younger children were abused. Members of the foster family were later arrested and charged with the abuse of multiple children placed in their care including at least one of the Turpin children. In early 2020, the Riverside County Deputy District Attorney reported that some of the Turpin children were living independently and working and going to school. One had graduated from college. The ABC series 2020 aired a special update in 2021 about the Turpin case, titled Escape from a House of Horror. The program claimed that Riverside County Social Services had not properly dispersed the hundreds of thousands of dollars that people had donated to the Turpin siblings. The money was placed in a trust controlled by a court-appointed public guardian. Joshua Turpin stated that he could not access funds and was even denied the purchase of a bicycle. During an interview with Diane Sawyer for the 2020 special, Jordan Turpin stated that she was released without warning from a foster home, without first being taught life skills, and with no plans for housing or knowledge of how to get food or health care. According to the report, Riverside County has hired a private law firm to investigate allegations of abuse and mismanagement of funds by the county's social services program. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. My administrative and production assistant is Lorena Garcia. If you'd like to listen to episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free, you could become a Patreon member. For as little as $2 per month, you'll get ad-free early release episodes, as well as cool OUAC merchandise sent to you in the mail. To find out more and sign up, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. We're just a couple of weeks away from CrimeCon Las Vegas. Secure your tickets now, bring along your best partner in crime, and come visit me and Lorena on Podcast Row. You'll spend the weekend immersed in true crime cases, Get the 411 on the latest investigations and get up close and personal with scads of true crime celebrities. Go to crimecon.com to register and use my promo code onceupon22 for 10% off your registration. And we'll see you in Las Vegas. Thanks for listening, subscribing, following, and telling a friend. Until next time, be good to one another.